My name is Alicia Alfredson from Pneumatic Datic, and this is Building Modern on a Budget. Today, I'm gonna to walk you guys through the rooms that by far you have asked the most questions about, the kitchen and the bathrooms. I'm gonna show you guys how we got a sleek, modern looking kitchen for a pretty modest price, and also show you where we saved some big money on our three and a half bathrooms. I'm Alicia. And I'm Bryce. And we are building a modern house. We're trying. Hopefully building a modern house. <laughs> we want a cool contemporary house and we need a workshop, but we have an impossible budget. So that means we have to get really creative and be prepared to roll up our sleeves and do some of the work ourselves. It'll be hard, but it will be worth it. This video is sponsored by DAP Products. I began working on our kitchen design several months before we started building. I had my heart set on a couple of wish list items, including a large central island with a waterfall countertop, and I somehow wanted to incorporate two ovens. Both Bryce and I love to cook, and I personally am a huge baker. I know having two ovens is kind of indulgent, but honestly, around the holidays, I will really use them. I also really love the look of open shelving in a kitchen, but in full disclosure, I just have too much ugly stuff that I need to store to have full open shelving instead of upper cabinets. I like the idea of having one solid wood floating shelf for commonly used items, and more typical cabinetry with doors to store everything else. With this house, we love the architecture so much that we want it to be the star of the show. That influenced our decision to use more minimal Euro style cabinets with full slab doors. Knowing me and knowing that I'm a woodworker, you can probably and rightly assume that cabinetry was not somewhere where I was gonna skimp on quality. Unfortunately, since our attention was divided throughout the entire house, we knew that there was no way we would have time to build custom cabinetry ourselves. Where we live, custom cabinetry almost always comes in with an incredibly premium price. Off-the-shelf cabinets were not gonna be an option to get the look we wanted, so we knew pretty early on we were left with one option, which was to try ready-to-assemble or RTA cabinets. Ready-to-assemble cabinets function exactly as the name implies. The components are flat packed shipped from the manufacturer to either the consumer or a cabinet builder. There are several high quality RTA cabinet manufacturers throughout the United States, but we found very, very few offer the more modern Euro style cabinets that we wanted. And out of the few who did, I only found two manufacturers that would offer both plywood boxes and real wood veneer doors. We ended up ordering everything online from a company named 27E Store. Our cabinets were not sponsored and we have no affiliation with that company, but I just wanna say we had a really great experience ordering from them. Putting the boxes together is a pretty straightforward process, kind of similar to assembling Ikea furniture. Once the drywallers were done and Bryce and I had finished painting the exterior of the house, it was time to start installation. To help make the upper cabinets easier to install, we started by screwing two by four ledger boards to the wall. The ledger boards were temporary, but they helped us hold and level the cabinets while we screwed them into place. Once the upper cabinet boxes were attached to the wall, we started moving in the lower units. The cabinet boxes were secured both to the studs in the wall behind them, as well as being attached to each other using shorter one and one quarter inch screws. As we started to attach the cabinet boxes together, there were a couple of places where we needed to incorporate some fully veneered paneling, specifically next to the wall oven and the refrigerator. We placed painter's tape on both sides of the cabinetry to help protect the veneer, and then used my Craig adaptive cutting system to make our cuts. If you haven't seen the ACS before, it's a pretty cool system. It's basically a track saw, a table, and a bunch of guides to help make super accurate cuts. As you look at the cabinet boxes, you might notice that they're frameless. Frameless cabinetry has become synonymous with the term Euro style. Since the majority of standard cabinet manufacturers in Europe now use this style, as opposed to a more traditional rail and style construction like they still do in the United States. We noticed there was a couple of places, particularly in the corners near the pantry wall, where the drywall mud built up in the corners made it difficult to get the cabinets in place. 
Removing just a tiny bit of material off the back corner of the cabinet boxes using a compact circular saw made fitting the boxes much easier. Once the basic framework of the kitchen cabinets was laid out, it was time to turn our attention to the drawer boxes. The door and drawer hardware that came with our order from 27 East Store was one of the places where I was the most impressed. All of their cabinetry comes standard with Bloom brand undermount drawer slides and soft close hinges for the doors. Those are typically upgrades that you pay quite a bit for from most companies. One of the biggest challenges of using a minimal design is any imperfection or poor fit is magnified. I was really worried that we were gonna have a difficult time getting all the flat slab drawer faces and cabinet doors to align perfectly. Fortunately, since we were using Bloom three-way adjustable hinges, minor adjustments were a piece of cake. I really was surprised how well all the doors fit. Once the cabinet doors were all in place and adjusted, we could begin building the range hood cover. Once again, I was going for a really sleek and minimal look. So I designed the hood cover as a simple white box that blended in with the upper cabinetry. With the same minimalism in mind, I installed low profile tab pull style cabinet door handles. I'll admit this style of cabinet pull isn't always the most functional, but looking at those sleek, glossy cabinet doors, I just couldn't bring myself to drill holes into the face of them. Also, after living with this kitchen and using it extensively for several months, we've never had any problem with the poles. Even our kids are able to open the doors and drawers easily. If you've watched previous episodes of Building Modern on a Budget, you have probably heard me say, budget is boss. We definitely incorporated a few splurges here and there, but the bathroom vanities were an area that we really thought we would be able to keep the costs down. Instead of ordering ready-to-assemble floating vanities from 27 E Store, we decided to purchase less expensive God Morgan vanities from Ikea. We made a few small modifications to the drawer slides and to the mounting hardware to make sure that the cabinets had more support from multiple studs in the walls behind the vanities. With the cabinetry in the bathroom and kitchens fully installed, it was time to bring in the countertops. I'm really, really proud of the deal that we were able to get on our countertop material. Like we've done in our past two remodels, we skipped the big box stores and fancy showrooms and went directly to the Arizona Tile Boneyard, which is a local stone supplier's overstock and clearance center. While pricing out fabrication and installation costs, I quickly learned that that fancy miter corner waterfall island that I wanted was going to require a lot of material. We got super lucky and I was able to find the exact countertop material that I wanted. We picked up three slabs of three centimeter thick white quartz for $350 each. We found an additional full slab of black quartz to use in the bathrooms for $150. I'm gonna jump and talk about the bathrooms for just a bit, but don't worry, I promise I'll come back to the kitchen. At the same time as we were having our countertops installed, our tile guy was working on our primary bathroom shower. We designed a large two-person shower with a built-in bench at one end. Luckily, we had enough of the black quartz left over to create a cool waterfall seat, 
as well as covering the shower threshold. I'm sure I'm gonna receive plenty of crap from some of you guys in the comment section below because we chose to hire a tile installer, although I'm fairly experienced with tile and could have done the installation myself. Please keep in mind that at this point in the build, we were running behind schedule, which would cost us more interest on our construction loan. I was homeschooling two children while continuing to work on other places in the house. And the last shower that I installed took me over three weeks. Though it may sound counterintuitive, I've learned from my general contractor father-in-law that sometimes hiring an affordable professional can actually be a cost-saving method. Additionally, in full disclosure, we had gotten a really good price on this cool 48 inch by 24 inch porcelain wood look tile for the shower walls. I have never installed tile that large on a vertical surface and I was a little apprehensive about my ability to get a good result. When Alonso, our installer, had finished the shower, it was time to install the shower glass surround. Today is shower day, so we're gonna have a glass surround. It's gonna come around the corner here, and we'll have a door over on that side. One of the cool things that we're doing with our shower is we're gonna have a uh, glass corner. So normally you'd have like clips holding that corner together, but we're gonna do a uh, butt place, so kind of an aquarium attachment. So we're gonna have that clear corner all the way around. I'll admit, it was pretty nerve wracking to watch the guys from the glass company drill into my newly installed quartz and beautiful tile walls. But luckily, as Bryce mentioned, we went with a company that was able to do aquarium glazing. So that meant fewer metal clips needing to be installed to hold the glass in place. Our shower clips, as you can see right here, are just a simple square chrome bracket that's bolted to the seat and then clamps the glass to hold it in place. Very clean. Once the shower enclosure was in place, the installer sealed the glass using clear silicone. At this point, our plumber, aka the Ninja, came in and installed the freestanding bathtub, sinks, and water fixtures under the cover of darkness. Or so I'm assuming, because we never saw him. One of my final jobs was to connect the two floating IKEA God Morgan vanities in the primary bathroom together, making them look like one cohesive unit. When we purchased the vanities, I also purchased an additional God Morgan wall cabinet that I could use for material. I measured the space between the two existing vanities and cut down the door of the wall cabinet to create two floating shelves. I attached the shelves using glue and screw through pocket holes, which both make the vanity as a unit stronger and provides us a place to store some extra towels. As I promised before, at this point, we turned our attention back to the kitchen and started to work on the floating wood shelf. To match the gorgeous floating stairs that we featured in episode 11 of Building Modern on a Budget, we decided to use eight quarter poplar hardwood for the floating shelves in the kitchen as well. After milling the boards to get the correct thickness, we began cutting the boards into rough sections using a miter saw, my ACS, and then ultimately a table saw. We had to cut 22 and a half degree angles on the ends of two of the shelves to accommodate for the angled pantry wall. We used a chalk line to mark out the location for the shelf, and then we spaced out the brackets along the length of each shelf, trying to screw into studs whenever possible. Every screw that didn't line up with the stud was secured using a heavy duty drywall anchor. With the brackets in place, we brought the wood shelves back in and marked the location of the brackets in relation to the shelf. All right, drill bits. This guy is not going to work. It is 
too small, it's too short. Um, so the metal rods for the shelf hardware that we're installing um, needs a hole that's at least six inches deep. This guy's five inches or so. Okay, I know, I realize. <laughs> There's no way to talk about this without it sounding like a It's a drill bit. Grow up, people. It's a drill bit. Okay, so the five inch drill bit is too small for our hole. <laughs> okay, so we had to go out and buy this guy. I think it's 12 inches. Ideally, I would like the hole that we drill to be maybe a 32nd of an inch smaller, just so we have a tighter fit. But when you get these extra long bits, they don't make those tiny little increments. I mean, I'm sure somebody makes them, but they don't sell them readily at the hardware store. Yeah. So half inch drill bit, we're hoping maybe our compounding errors between the holes will help snug up the fit a little bit. We used a cool little tool called a self-centering doweling jig to drill the holes for the hardware. You can see we slid a quarter inch shim on one side of the jig. That's because we didn't want the holes directly in the middle of the edge of the board. We wanted them slightly higher up and I'll explain why. Instead of placing our electrical outlets for the kitchen on the wall like you would traditionally see, I had the idea to incorporate a hidden strip of electrical outlets to the underside of the floating shelf. This meant that we needed to cut a one inch deep by one and one quarter inch wide groove on the underside of each wooden shelf. Even though it's a very messy process, we were able to easily do so by making multiple passes using a plunge router. Next, I sanded all the edges and grooves of the shelves to get them ready for finish. I sprayed on three coats of spar urethane water-based finish. Spar urethane is typically used for outdoor applications, so that means hopefully our wood shelves will be protected against any accidental moisture that might get on them in the kitchen environment. We fed the Romex power supply wires through the back side of the shelves and began to install them onto the brackets. a mortise which is a shallow depression in the edge of this board in order to accommodate the back plate of the support. Even though it's only about a sixteenth of an inch thick, that back plate will prevent us from pushing the shelf all the way flush to the wall. In our case that's not really a problem because we plan on adding a tile backsplash all around the shelf which will cover up that gap. We were pleasantly surprised to see that the fit of the wooden shelves on the brackets was surprisingly snug which meant we didn't need to use any additional screws or adhesive to hold them in place. Okay, what's the plan? Uh, the plan is to shove it in and screw it. You're gonna be lifting it? I'm like... Yeah, I can lift it and then you can run all the screws in. All right, it's pre-drilled? Yeah. Okay. I've already had it in once, so it should just be putting it back where it was. Okay, let's do it. All right. Is it heavy? No, I mean extremely. <laughs> One of the last steps in the kitchen installation was to go around and seal up any gaps around the cabinetry and countertops. I used DAP Dynaflex Ultra to seal in the small space between the floating island countertop and the cabinetry. Speaking of sealing up gaps, after using our primary shower a couple of times, we discovered that we had a problem. When the shower glass guys came to install the doors and the surround, they used silicone sealant around everything. But we've noticed as we've turned on the shower a couple of times, we actually have a leak right down here next to this bracket. So we decided to try a new product from DAP called Ultra Clear. This stuff sounds really, really cool. It is water resistant immediately. It will actually adhere to wet surfaces and it dries even more clear than silicone. Another thing it can do, which traditional silicone can't, is it can be painted. 
It's perfect for kitchens and bathrooms, and because it's super, super clear, that's why we are using it next to this glass. There are three more bathrooms in the house, including a full bathroom in the loft upstairs, which we finished in episode 10 of Building Modern on a Budget. We added a couple of cool touches to the powder room, including a clear glass vessel sink and a concrete accent wall using the same concrete panels that we used on our fireplace in episode nine. Right now our twin boys bathroom is pretty boring, but I have some big plans in the future, so you'll wanna stay tuned for those. Are you ready for the big reveals? I recently heard in a documentary that the primary bathroom is the most used room in the house. If you have really sharp eyes, you might notice that the primary bathroom isn't quite done. We still have plans to wrap the wood look tile around the wall and behind the vanity to work as a backsplash. I have some cool DIY handles that I've made for the barn doors as well. And in the future, that gaping hole will be filled with a hidden secret door that leads into the laundry room. And now for the heart of the home and my personally favorite room, the kitchen. I really like having the option to choose between a gas oven or the electric wall oven. Like a lot of stories I've heard from people building and remodeling during 2020, we had a lot of problems sourcing our appliances. I'll spare you all the gory details, but the microwave wall oven combo in particular gave us quite the headache. After eight months of using this kitchen almost every day, there is very little that I would change. I absolutely love this room. I'll try to link as many of the sources that I can remember in the comment section below, but make sure you leave a comment if you have a specific question.
You can see the round poplar dining table in the distance. Let me know in the comment section if you guys would be interested in a how-to video for it. As I mentioned in our last video covering the exterior of our house, I'm well aware that construction prices have gone up dramatically since we purchased them last year. Keeping that in mind, I knew before we started construction that kitchens and bathrooms are a place that homeowners tend to break the budget. In order to try to get the finishes we want within our budget, it took a lot of research and looking around. I think addressing the cost of kitchens and bathrooms is a great opportunity to talk about compromise when it comes to building your own house. Although I really, really love the way that our kitchen and bathrooms turned out, they might look slightly different if I had a limitless budget. But I think I was able to get pretty close to the look I was going for by being patient, shopping around, and being willing to compromise on a few things. For example, the IKEA cabinets in our bathrooms. I've left links for our product sources in the description box below. The cabinets for our kitchen and laundry room cost us $13,373. The additional IKEA cabinets for our bathroom cost us $1,127. So in total, we spent $14,500 for all the cabinets for our entire house. That was actually $500 under budget. As I mentioned before, we got a great deal on our countertop material, and after tax, it cost us around $1,300. The labor to fabricate and install the countertops was an additional $4,200. So that puts our total cost spent for countertops around $5,500. We kind of had a weird situation when it came to purchase all of our appliances. So the cost is actually broken into two categories. The bulk of our appliances cost us around $4,800. We had a lot of trouble sourcing our microwave and wall oven combo. Until shortly before moving into the house, we were starting to think we weren't even going to be able to find a wall oven to install. We eventually found one in the nick of time and it cost $2,834, which we paid out of pocket. The cost of the tile for our bathroom plus the shower fabrication and install cost us $3,110. The shower glass enclosure cost us an additional $1,867. So altogether, our master shower and our bathroom tile cost us just shy of $5,000. Another line item under budget. The entire septic system, including testing and installation, cost us around $8,200. Our propane tank filled and installed cost us just under $1,500. At this point, we have drawn around $255,000 from our construction loan. The cabinet hardware for our entire house came in around $130. The tile we chose for our kitchen backsplash cost us around $600, and we spent around another $450 for setting materials and the labor to install it. The poplar hardwood that we made our floating shelves out of cost us around $60. We spent approximately another $350 for things like screws, brackets, caulk, that kind of stuff to finish out the kitchen. So that brings our out-of-pocket total just shy of $55,000. Well, we have pretty much covered the entire construction of our detached workshop and our modern custom house start to finish. The next episode of Building Modern on a Budget will be a house tour and final reveal. Thank you for being patient and thank you for understanding the highs and lows that come with building your own house for the first time. If you want to get caught up on the rest of the Building Modern on a Budget series, you'll want to check out this playlist. And if you like other types of DIY content, check out this video as well. The last Building Modern on a Budget video is going to be coming out soon and it is the big reveal, the final house tour. Make sure you're subscribed to the Pneumatic Datic channel so you don't miss it. As always, thanks for watching guys.